Good morning, my name is Jennifer, and today I'm going to make a Bruderkäse cheese, which is a butter cheese, it's a German cheese, it's a semi-soft, rich cheese, full fat. It's just an all-around good eating cheese, it's very easy to make, and it ripens fairly quickly, as early as four weeks. So if you are impatient or starting out with cheese making and want to see what the results are as soon as possible, this is a good one to start with. First off, we're gonna heat the milk to a certain number of degrees, which I have to go check my notes, 102 degrees. We have a little bit more than seven gallons of milk, seven and a half maybe. I am using Gavin Weber's recipe. This is the recipe I've used pretty much all the way through. Though I am adding a component that comes from the New England Cheesemaking Supply Company. They have a ton of recipes. They're very, very clear and good to follow. Their recipe calls for adding a little bit of geotrichum candidum to it, which gives that white powdery on the outside thing that happens. I just made this cheese with the geotrichum for the first time uh, about a month ago and it's delicious. It's really good. It's lunchtime right now. I was busy all morning and I have five hours to knock this cheese out. So we'll see if I can complete it in this amount of time, but I think it's pretty much a fast cheese if I remember correctly. So if you have a shortage of time, do this. Normally you can use uh, mesophilic and thermophilic culture starters. Last time I made it, I just used a thermophilic one. Today, I'm going to be using clabber cultures. I'm always doing something different, something new, just to see what we like, what we don't like, and we almost always, always, always like whatever I do with this Buddha case of cheese. This is a good, good recipe, so go for it. Using clabber for my culture. Oh, it smells so buttery and creamy and delicious. It's amazing stuff. It's a quarter cup per gallon of milk, so this is gonna be about, you know, one and three quarter cups of clabber. And that's what's gonna go into the milk when it is at temperature, ready to be cultured. Clabber is just milk that has been set out at room temperature to thicken. Once you have an established clabber that you use to freshen a new milk every day, it takes only 24 hours to thicken into clabber. But in the beginning, when you take raw milk and let it sit out, it takes a few days and then several feedings to get strong enough to become a clabber that you can use for cheese making. It just lives on my counter all the time. Here's the clabber that is ready to be used. Shake it up really good. So now it's like a thin yogurt, so it smells tangy. That's how it is. Now that I broke the set. Yep, there we are, 102 degrees, 102.2. Now it's time to add the starter culture, either a thermophilic culture or a mix of meso and thermo, or in this case, using clabber. Mix it in for about 30 seconds or so just to get it well mixed. Other cultures, I could use kazu culture or MOT92. Also used yogurt to culture of There's a variety of choices. But Clabber has been making superior cheeses, and I'm going with Clabber. At this point, I'm also going to add the geotrichum candidum. It's 1 8 teaspoon, so this is a quarter teaspoon, and it's a half of that. Just sprinkle it over top. I know I said it takes like five hours to make this cheese. Much of the time spent is waiting. I have 40 minutes right now where I'm waiting. Then I will have the, the rennet added and I have to wait more. And there's just little gaps here and there. So I still get a, a lot of other things done. Today I'm baking off some sourdough bread. So I've preheated the Dutch ovens. They're nice and hot. I'm gonna dock these loaves so that they get a good oven spring. Lift them into the pans and put ice around the edges between the parchment paper and the Dutch oven. And that will create a steam effect Pop it in the oven for 20 minutes, take the lids off and bake it another 20 minutes and then you get the nice golden brown color. For the rennet, it is supposed to be a quarter teaspoon per gallon of milk, more or less. So for this recipe, I should be using one and three quarter teaspoons of rennet. However, I know that too much rennet tends to make a cheese a little bit rubbery and I have had good success with dialing back the rennet just a little bit. So for this amount, seven gallons of milk or thereabouts, I'm going to do one and a half teaspoons of rennet, maybe a tiny bit more. It's just all I need and it does the job. So why add more rennet and waste more of this expensive product if I don't need to? It is now time to check the curd to see if we have a clean break. Well, you can see whey on top. As I go along. That feels kind of like watery. That's weird. Yep, it's a clean break. Half inch cubes. Just 
stir it slowly for about 20 minutes, breaking up the extra large pieces to make sure they're all about the same size, getting some of the whey out. That's this first step, just simply stirring. Feels almost rubbery and boingy. And you just pop it apart if they're too big. Curds are feeling pretty large and pretty voluptuous, boingy on the outside. There is the fear that they are not going to release all the whey inside. This is what I always feel like with Buddha Keza. It's just kind of at a point where I'm not sure how this is going to end up, but you just keep going, don't worry about it. But that's what it's like. It's much bigger, fatter curds than other cheeses. I have made a version of Buddha Keza before on the blog and it's under the title Fat Cow Cheese because I added a whole bunch extra heavy whipping cream to this. It makes a fantastic cheese. It's like sliceable cream cheese and the flavor is so, so good. Now I'm gonna let it rest so it heals and so that the curds sink to the bottom. While that curd is resting for five minutes, I'm gonna get my hot water ready to go so that I can wash the curds. So our spigot water is about 125, 130 degrees. It's really hot. So I'm gonna use that. I'm also gonna heat up some water in my tea kettle thingy. I tend to go right around between 130, 140 degrees. That's kind of the average temperature with which you wash curds if you're raising the temperature. Sometimes it's lower, sometimes it's higher, but if you don't know, aim for 130, 140. If you start catching curds, go slower. You could use this way to water plants or make soups or add it to your bread or make ricotta. You can check up here to see how to make ricotta from whey, or you could um, feed it to your pigs. They love it. Starting to kick up a lot of curds, so I need to go slower. It's not quite half, but I'm gonna consider that good enough, and I'm going to start adding the hot water and stirring this. Try to get up to 108 degrees. We'll see how fast this goes. You wanna add not too much water at a time because you don't want to cook all the curds in one spot or cook them fast. You wanna give it time for the curds to heat up uniformly. If you find big ones, just pop them open still. Keep them going. Because if you get whey locked in here in the cheese, when you're pressing it, that whey will create a pocket and it will continue to express and you'll get, um, it gets kind of acidy. It just doesn't taste good. You want these to all be even so that they press evenly and you don't have excess moisture and acid development in the cheese after you're done pressing it. And look at that, we're up to 108 degrees and we're up to the line of where the milk had been. So we have matched that. So that is a good sign that we have done the right proportions more or less. It probably took me a good 10 minutes to add that hot water. So now I'm supposed to stir this for 10 minutes Continue to cook them and shrink them down a little bit. You can see they're getting a little bit more solid. They're still splooshy. Let me see how they knit. Take a handful. Oh, there's the big one. See, I'm gonna break that apart. Squeeze. They feel squishy. See, they're popping out the bottom. Boop. But they're knitting together and they're beginning to crumble apart. They need a little bit more. This is what the curd looks like. There's still some splooshiness, but it's feeling a lot more firm, a lot more rubbery and boingy. Squeezing it, it pretty much doesn't sploosh like it did. It's not as loose and it's holding together well and it crumbles the part much ni more nicely. So I think this is done. It feels, it feels good. It feels like it's gonna be a juicy, soft cheese that's moist and pleasant and is gonna be mild and sweet. I'm excited about it. What I do now is let this sit here in the whey for 10 minutes. It's continuing to acidify in the whey. Got it, it's really heavy. I think it's pretty much attached to the bottom, but just go slow. Slow, slow. It's a full bucket of whey. Okay, stop. That's good. Stop. Go ahead. Oof. I'm kind of breaking this up with my fingers. Oh, crap. I just totally threw cheese on the floor. Guess that didn't work. And I'm going to have to call the dogs in. Mmm, that's so good. Mmm. Wow. Danny, Coco, come here. You want the cheese? Eat the cheese. Go on, Danny. You got it. Thank you. Bye. Oops, sorry. Didn't mean to step on your foot. Leave. Let me just close that up for a second. The curds rested in the kettle in the way for longer than 10 minutes. So it was maybe 20. So things are fluctuating as we go along. I'm not too concerned. This is what happens with cheese. You have to live your life and people for centuries have been making cheese and living their lives and not being obsessed with every little detail. And it still turns out. It's different. It's unique. Not quite the same. It's just the same as saying it's different and it's unique. 
but that's just cheese making. This has now settled to right the level. So it's, it's good. I can take this part out. And interestingly enough, my friends, it is four o'clock right now. So I have the cheese in the press and I think I started around 1230 ish. So that means three and a half hours you get it into the press and I'm going to flip it maybe once or twice, go away for the evening, come back and flip it again before bed, let it go overnight. That's it. That's the cheese. It's so easy. It's supposed to be pressed at 11 pounds, like hardly any pressure for 30 minutes flipped and then go for nine hours. I'm going to be going for at least 16 hours probably. And and I will be pressing it at a harder pressure and I'll probably flip it a couple extra times just because, I don't know, because I like to do that. Do what you want. Right there's at 20 pounds. This cheese, because the curds are fatter and juicier, you don't want to press it hard in the beginning because you could express more of the whey from the inside and the cream and the fat and it's not as cooked. So you have to be a little bit more gentle at the start. It is down to here right now. It is good to go. It's magnificently beautiful. It's crooked, but it should even out as I go. And right now it's like 30 pounds, so it's kind of low. Not much liquid is coming out. I maybe we'll do a little bit more, a little bit harder. Yeah, about 35. And let this go till bedtime and I'll flip it again. <laughs> pounds two ounces if I'm doing four hours per pound of cheese it is going to be 32 hours so mid-afternoon on Sunday I will take it out of the brine Oof, this is cold brine which is not ideal but it works should be room temperature Ooh, lots of salt I just keep this sitting on the counter I haven't washed it this is the same brine I think since like last October it's May now just keep using it you keep adding more salt and it's, it's good. The cheese has just been sitting here getting a nice rind, but it's now starting to get like a, a greasiness to it. It's warm today, it's in the 80s, and I think it's time for this to get put into the cheese cave. Because this is a butter cheese, and because it has the, the white mold in it, the Geotrichum candidum, I think, that is going to be getting the white fuzziness on the outside. So it has to continue aging without being vacuum sealed. So I'm just gonna stick it directly into the fridge and let it just keep flipping it in there and hopefully that will soon start to develop. So you can see that cloth up top, it has been wrapped that one shelf. That's where the cold air is coming out. So that shelf gets frozen and then it rusts it and drips come down of rust. So we have that sheet around that shelf. Hopefully that will keep the drops from coming down the cheeses. And then I'm just putting the exposed ones towards the bottom so they have more protection. It's kind of risky, but that's what we cheese makers do. We take risks. So this is just gonna get set directly on here. So as you can see, there's no special humidity stuff happening. Oh, my hands are all buttery. All buttery, greasy and bruised from playing Ultimate. We'll let that just sit there and we'll keep flipping it a few days and we'll see how the mold develops. This bitter case is not developing any mold, but it is dry and it's not cracking. Well, there's a little bit of white dust. It's got white dust on it, kind of. It is time to taste the Budokeza. It has been almost exactly 10 weeks. You can eat a Budokeza at the four week mark, but I didn't get around to it. So let's go get that cheese. I switched it from the cheeser, which is the old freezer that is now my cheese cave, so I call it a cheeser, to the wine fridge, which is actually probably much more temperature stable. I flip it about once a week 
There has not been any mold growth on this the time before. It was just like a little bit of a white dusty powder on the outside. This one just seems like a regular cheese. I'm assuming the lack of white powder on the outside is due to humidity conditions, which I do not monitor very closely or at all. So um, that's on me. However, the Geotrichum candidum is supposed to still provide an earthy flavor, a nuttiness to a cheese that may be there, even though we have no visual evidence of it. We're going to find out. You can see it's getting a little bit of blue mold or, or something on there, a few spots of that, which I'm not worried about. There is a little bit of powderiness on that. It had much more of like a, like it's been dusted with confection or sugar or flour look. And this time, no. These little brown spots are from when it was in the cheeser and a drop of like rusty water got on it and I tried to wipe it off and didn't do a good job. So I'm going to clean this up just a little bit. This is tap water in an old rag. See if I can wash that off. Cause you don't want to eat rust. Yep, comes right off. Let's see what happens with these little mold dots. Yeah, they come off. So that's basically a clean cheese. It smells a little bit nutty. It smells a little bit like a Swiss almost. Listen to how hard it is. So that's what it sounds like. So it has a, a good rind. It's not squishing at all. It feels pretty hard. You can see a slight bubble, a slight rise, which is normal with my cheeses. Oh, you can see blue mold showing up on these. I wash these bamboo mats every time with hot soap and water, scrub them really well, and then I spray them with my vinegar water solution and let them air dry. Still, stuff happens, it's okay. Not too upsetting. Let's cut into this baby. Two and a half months old, a natural rind. Oh my word, this is hard. It's a hard cheese. What? Oh, it's pretty. <laughs> Look, you can see the natural rind, the dark yellow, like the, the, the almost, um, it turns like a clear color. I don't know how to say that, but that's what you see in actual cheese shops, if I might be so bold as to point out. It almost looks like a kind of shatter that's so hard as it goes along. You have me mechanical holes in here, which are just irregular. There's nothing wrong with that. It feels firm, but there's also a tenderness to it. So let's taste this beast. It actually feels harder than I expected. Here's the wedge. You can see holes through it a little bit. Let's break off some of the middle part. It's splendid. This is getting boring. If it's always splendid, I mean, how boring is that? This is the edge. Mm. At the very end, I got a little hit of something that was a little bit sharp. I don't quite think bitter is the word. It's definitely a little bit like waxy or a little dry, just kind of like crusty. <laughs> you could totally cut it off. It's not, it's not bad. If you put it in a grilled cheese sandwich, nobody's gonna know it's there probably because it will melt and absorb into the other cheese. But if you're eating it plain, you might not want that very little bit here. I just took the little edge off the outside. It's drier, a little more crumbly. That bitterness is gone. So whatever that is, that just might be like air stuff, refrigerator stuff, whatever. But the inside is tender and chewy. It's soft. It's not elasticy like a Swiss cheese, and it's not as crumbly as a cheddar cheese, and it's not as. <laughs> It's more of an in-between, like a Colby cheddar. It's like kind of, in, I don't know how to describe it. Like it bends, but it breaks. So it's, it's tender, but it's not soft. I mean, it's soft. I don't know what to call this. Oh, it's a cheese. It's really, really good. One of those crowd-pleasing cheeses that you make really fast in several hours in one day and four weeks, got a cheese. There's nothing complicated about this one. This one is a winner. Mm, it's really good. Oh, um, about the geotrichum, this tastes more interesting to me than the blander booter cases I made before. So I don't know if that's the clabber or if it's the geotrichum. Like maybe that is adding an element of nuance, of flavor to this cheese that I'm not aware of, but it does taste more robust, a little bit more nutty, a little bit more depth than just a plain cheese like there's something here could be also because it was the natural vine cheese it wasn't backpacked maybe that added that element i don't know but it's good mm, i really like it now to backpack it
It is pretty hard. I like that. And we should do the crossways cut so you can see what it's like. So you can see the holes this way. Like remember what I learned with the Swiss cheese? That if you cut it on the other side, how does that look? It looks pretty much the same. This one didn't really change whole structure too much from the side. I think this one's beautiful. I might not be around here much for the next several weeks. I've been trying to post twice monthly and I might have to put the brakes on that just a little bit because this week is opening week for a show I am in. Theater shows are all consuming, I only have enough brain space for one creative project. And so when I am focused on theater and cramming lots of lines, I can hardly do anything. It's just words coming into my brain. Anyway, in my absence, I am still very much here. My brain might not be, but I am here, still eating cheese, still working on videos. I will still answer your comments. I will still answer your questions. I am hearing what you guys say to me and I am loving learning from you in the polls on my community tab. So go click on those and take those polls. Community tab is right at the top and that's gonna stay active, so check it out. One other thing is I am continuing to nibble away at this cheese, I'm backpacking it. I am detecting a very, very slight graininess. If you eat it with something, there's no way you will notice it. Even just eating it plain, you probably wouldn't notice it. Like, I, I can hardly detect it, but I am wondering what that is. If you know, let me know in the comments. If I continue to let this cheese age indefinitely, it would get sharper, more, more nuanced flavor. Now that it's backpacked, I think it's gonna stay pretty stable for at least a few months. Ta-da! I finished backpacking the cheese. That one that's not packed is going to go into the fridge so we can eat it.